Hello and welcome to a new episode of this series. What I want to do here is, of course, to give you the option to have some points discussed to really create neutral textures. And neutral textures means here that we have textures that represent the world, not as we see it, because our eyes are pretty much adaptive. And whatever we focus on, the little spot that gets adjusted in terms of brightness and so on. And in that way, we create memory pictures of an image and not the reality. Cinema 4D can't deal with those adaptive things. We need neutral material. And in that way, even if an image looks good, it looks good to our eyes. But if we put a light on it, if we use it in Cinema 4D, we need absolutely the neutral representation of the world around us. We do not produce art with textures. We do not produce vacation images or portraits. We do not push saturation or contrast. We do not roll out highlights or we crash plaques here just because it looks cool. This would be the end of a texture and especially tone mapping would be a devastating result of our work. What I want to give you here, of course, is a list of things that I think is needed to be discussed even shortly, like focus. You will see how fast I <laughs> check this up. And we have a second list here beneath that that will be much faster. This list here takes a while, so grab a coffee, lean back and enjoy the show. I hope you do. Okay, let's start with focus. I was not certain if I should put the focus here at all into the list. But in the moment I put it away, maybe someone thinks, oh, it's not important. We have certainly uh, plugged in that, fix it in post. No, we don't. And the truth is the focus needs to be spot on. There's no wiggle room and we can not sharpen things. It's not possible. There's, of course, an option to get some blurriness out of the image, but the quality that we get with a properly set focus can't be replaced with anything. So put your automatic off if it isn't working very well and set the focus manually. If you have a problem to set this, go back and forth with the focus, shoot focus bracketing if needed, if everything is too dark or whatever. There's always a way to get this done. There's no excuse to have any blurry pictures. Again, we do not produce art here. We produce neutral images. The focal length is normally nothing that we have to discuss in depth to explain what it is, but the results of each focal length or lens length or wide and long and taller or whatever you want to name it is of course very, very important to know because when we have, for example, a wide angle lens, then we have a wide or a large field of view and some prefer to mark it in this way with a distance. I don't care here at the moment because the most important part is that we can see a lot of stuff in a short distance from the camera. This here is the camera. If I have a longer lens, then I have maybe something like this here to get maybe the same distance. If that is that distance here. It's a little bit sloppy here from my side, but you get the idea. The distance to the object, and that here could be Y for example, is much longer than the wide angle lens. And when we have here maybe an object that is not just flat, when we have something here that has maybe an object like a stoner, so that looks out in this way, then this here, it directly much smaller in distance to the camera than this object here. And this shows up, of course. This here is extreme. I don't think that we have all the time such textures. But the more far away you are, the more flat it is. And normally textures like on this cube here, for example, is a texture that we put here on that front. And then we don't want to have any perspective or parallax inside of that texture. We want to have it flat. If not the case, then we have to think about camera mapping or displacement or whatever fits the most in that case. So let's have a look to some examples of that. This image here is done with a 200 millimeter lens and a full frame sensor. The sensor size has always um, part of the whole equation in it when we talk about field of view. 
the length doesn't change. But you can see here that these stones are relatively flat and you can't see around these stones. The stones by itself does not occlude the backside of them. And when you take a look here to this area here, we will take a look from another perspective, then you might see how this changes here. This looks more like a print of something, very flat. And I have shown this in an earlier tutorial, how we get the volume back. But for the sake of this image, we need it as flat as possible. This distance, by the way, is pretty much a four lane street between the camera and the wall. In this example, I have moved the camera a little bit with our target point to the side to show you the effect because when I look here directly, we see only on the border a little bit what we have. And we can see here all the time, all the stones only from the left side. Everything that is here on the right is already obscured by themselves. And I will show you a more extreme example of this. And of course it's extreme because I want to make my point. Here I look very straight to this stone perpendicular, so to say. And the lens is so wide that we can see here to the side. It's 180 degree the whole view. It's a fish eye undistorted to make it a little bit more viewable. And we can see here really, we see only the sides with standard wide angle lenses that wouldn't be so extreme. But if you put a wide angle view to a flat object and you use then a normal lens that doesn't match anymore and it gives a weird feeling. No one can put the finger on it because you tell a story maybe or you show something and you don't have the time to evaluate what happens to the picture. You just get away with a bad feeling. And so to have something that is maybe so extreme like this here and then just put it on a flat surface will not work very well. I hope that point made a little bit sense and make your own tests. Take any camera, even a point and shoot and use the wide and the long lens and frame exactly the same object in the same way so you get the same result and compare then how it shows up. If an object is really completely flat and the lens has no distortion and no artifacts, then you might get away with a good result when you use a wide lens. But in the moment you can use a longer lens, you do not cast shadow on the object, you do not influence with your clothes the lightning situation here. And so my preferred way is as long as possible. <laughs> of course, there's a border. If you use a very long lens, there's so much stuff between the object and your lens that it makes no sense, of course. I think 200 millimeter is a good way. 135 would be also very acceptable. And it's certainly to your advantage. Okay, the next part here. The aperture is not only there to change the amount of light that finally is hit by the sensor, independent from the time. It's a mechanism in the lens which distributes the light more or less. Most of the time it is just an object that is created out of many little segments and these segments have a joint point and they move inside the lens. And in that way, they can create a large, a small or a smaller hole. So the, the hole is variable. And with this mechanism, the aperture, we create also what we want to discuss later on, the depths of field and a shallow depths of field, for example. But the whole story of depths of field will be discussed later. So what I want to discuss here is not the amount of depths of field or shallow depths of field, it is the sharpness that is finally left over. And there is a misconception in parts of the camera users, because I think when it's full open, the blurriness is the largest, because it's shallow depths of field, which is not exactly defined for the focus point, for the point where we have our target put to our attention. 
and when it's the smallest the depth of field is the largest so the assumption is that there's also the sharpest overall for this part here where we have our target the truth is that it is low on a start it goes up and then it goes down again and in this area here where we have a medium-sized aperture we have the sweet spot of a lens and you can see this in lens tests for example when you just have the option to change for the resolving power of the lens the aperture and I want to show you that of course in an example in this image I have my lens chart it's a cheap one it's just plastic but the lines are very straight and that is all what I care about I didn't want to pay hundred dollars or so for an exclusive print this one here was three dollars and a few bucks for the wood anyway that serves my purpose here and what I want to show you here is of course the middle part and this part of the tutorial I will go later to the edges here when we talk about other stuff in the middle I have my focus point set and that's the most important part here and I have a sequence of images with 2.84 5.68 11 16 and 22 the full stops always I have the whole list with third stops but I thought hmm, that's maybe a little bit over the top and even with the full stops I thought that's too long to show them all I will show you that but more importantly what I want to do here is to go to the middle field because on the edges we have already some depths of field problems or appearances <laughs> and I go here to 400% and maybe let's find a place where I can see already a little bit blurriness from let's start here okay so when I go here to this place you can see there's a traumatic change <laughs> that has a little bit to do with the light but in truth I haven't changed the noise the sharpness anything of this image it's pretty much opened from raw and saved out that's all I have done and in this case it's JPEG to have it small but what I want to show you here is of course the difference between 22 8 and 2.8 this is normally considered an area where we can expect wide open a little bit of blurriness or a little bit too much light in it which takes the contrast away and with 8 that's most of the time considered the sweet spot of course some lenses have already the sweet spot reached by 4.0 or 5.6 you have to check your reviews to lenses or whatever where you can see how the resolving power of that lens is related to the f-stops and let's go here from 22 and maybe i go here a little bit down to get another field now we have 16 11 8 5.6 and 4 and the changes are too small so when I go here just with this to this, it's relatively similar and to 8, I think I get a sharper picture here and it's, it's even not that noisy here. Okay, so I think I could make a little bit of point, but you will find any review that the start and the end point is most of the time not the optimal place of a lens it's mostly in the middle 5.6 8 or even 11 depends on the lens okay i go back here the next point is lens color or lens contrast and or because they both belong together in terms of sewers and the sewers is always i would think based on the coatings the coatings of a lens is normally there to avoid reflections inner reflections ghosting and so on lens flare to name one of the more prominent effects and some people love that so they take the coating off the lens or just choose old class with very bad coating or with no coating at all because that was not always on the lens 100 150 years ago there was not really an era of quality coating if there was coating at all and so the contrast of the lens was pretty low and they couldn't really use a lot of light then 
what was shining into the lens. Anyway, I digress. The idea here is that each coating finally tries to get light off the inner reflections and that is done by filtering out something. <laughs> And the coating itself can be different. For cine lenses, it can even a little bit yellowish. And to have all these colors available, you have to shut off, of course, the auto white balance. And of course, when you have a cray card and you take the cray card and you balance to that cray point, this color would vanish as well. But it has influenced the whole picture. It's not that with white balance all the color shifts are gone. When there's a ye little yellow in the lens, then that will change the whole balance, of course. The contrast, the better the coating, the better the contrast, I would think. But that's, of course, always a comparison. So check out your lenses, make tests, get to know them. That's the little hint that I want to give you here with that. And auto white balance on is never a good idea. Because if you have maybe a um, wall totally with red bricks and you shoot this, the red color or the brownish color of the bricks will of course indicate that you have an evening scene for example and the color temperature goes in a different direction than you want to have it. So always have the auto white balance off. If you have a measurement, if you have a gray card, whatever helps you to estimate what it is and I talk here only about texture because we have to talk about white balance in a separate scene, then try to make it manual, try to get the real values in it. Just a little hint and not to expand here more than needed. The next point is depth of field or shallow depth of field. And I have explained here already a little bit, so I will start very fast with that. Depth of field is highly dependent on the aperture. And some people would even say it's dependent on the lens field of view. But the truth is, as I've shown you this in a comparison, when you have a wide angle lens like this one here, same spot here, same origin where the camera is, then it's most likely to get the object, the actor, whatever in the scene, you pull it very close to it. And that influences, of course, the relationship. If you put it as far away in distance to the camera and then scale in or out in Photoshop to the same picture, one time taken with the wide, one time taken with the long lens, same aperture, then you will see the depth of field is the same. So it's not really the lens, but of course it appears that wide angle lens, especially fish eyes, have nearly no depths of field problems and problems means shallow depths of field, which is, by the way, when you want to be more artistic in your images, a huge advantage to use because you can separate objects from the background or foreground and that leads the eye of the viewer and that's of course cinematography or photography in its best. Too blurry means you disconnect it finally, the object, or you disconnect the actor and that can be troublesome sometimes. So always the right amount, but I digress here. Depths of field. We don't want to have a shallow depths of field for our work because when we have an object here textured on our cube in Cinema 4D, then we don't want to have shallow depths of field artifacts in it, bokeh and blooming highlights and so on, whatever we get from shallow depths of field if it is not set correctly. And if we have something here on this surface and the camera finally in Cinema 4D has a look to that object, then if we want to make it right, we have to set the camera to the same depth of field for the whole scene so we don't have a mismatch inside of the texture to the whole scene. If we move the camera, it becomes nearly impossible to hold that relationship and so it breaks apart. And to have maybe from the field of the camera, a uh, shallow depth of field, that means blurry, then something sharp in the picture, and then something blurry again, background and bokeh, and then something sharp again, that doesn't work, is not possible, is possible in Cinema 4D because we simulate so stuff, but it's not really how the world works. And so textures should be always 
without shallow dust or field. Any object that we want to have as texture should be inside of the most sharp areas. And I will show you what it does to pictures. This time I go not to our focus area. I want to go here to the side because this here is not perpendicular to the camera. This right part is closer to the camera. The left part is more far away. So I have a nice variety of my depth of field here. I can see both areas. That was the reason why I have rotated this a little bit. And you can see here a little bit of the bokeh effect. And when I go here to 8, it's sharper. And when I go to 22, there's nearly no bokeh effect anymore. And so back to... 2.8 here and I want to have here something like this maybe where it's not too dark and so I go here to this area and I want to have a crossing point so we see here already some color in it and that's certainly nothing really fun you can see that it's all over the place and on the other side we have a different colorization there's more green in it and so that's something very bad. <laughs> so, okay, 2.8, shallow dust of field. And 8, much better. Even we have here some problems. And with 22, much sharper. But it's really not very precise here. We have some chromatic aberration. We come to this later. So let's go step by step. 2.16, to 11, to 8, to 5.6, to 4.0, and 2.8. If you have a texture with such an artifact of shallow depth of field, you run into trouble. And there's no really a fix because uh, this information is lost and you can sharpen it. But with sharpening, maybe that works in a black and white image, but with many colors you get only dark edges and it gets even worse. And if that is then finally inside of a color grading, the black and the white on the edges will destroy the color grading more or less it shows up it's not really fun and not nice not my suggestion at all so depth of field always as much as possible that covers our area of interest we don't want to have any bokeh or light blooming or specular highlight blooming inside of that image that's not the way it should be okay so next one artifacts artifacts from the lens or from the light or whatever the idea is to talk about chromatic aberration or to talk about the sharpness that we have towards to the border of the lens or vignetting vignetting is of course very easy to fix it's mostly that it becomes darker to the sides of the end and of course lens distortion and these four parts are really individual parameters of each lens and you have to know them to fight them or just to take another lens if it is too much. Let's have a look to chromatic aberration. We have seen these pictures here already and we have seen the little color fringing around these squares. That is nothing that is inside of the texture of my board. It's just black and white and they wouldn't do such things of course and it becomes more prominent to the borders of the lens and I can go here even to 22 or to 8 to show you that here and we see that all over the place green and magenta or here on this side more yellowish bluish you can say maybe that's also near to green with a little bit too much red in it or <laughs> so Anyway, the point is that normally the light gets refracted inside of a lens. And of course, the light has different frequencies. And these different frequencies become differently refracted, which finally creates these rainbow effects that we see on that old pink Floyd cover and on every prism, of course. So there is normally a bunch of lenses inside of each lens or there's different class who tries to refract of course the main light and then with some other elements to bring some of these frequencies back but of course that is all based on a balance of sharpness of speed of refraction power and so on and so there's always a battle what is the most important part is it the overall sharpness is it the overall chromatic aberration is it 
whatever, you will find a long, long theme about lenses in discussion all over the place. And when you go together with cinematographers, that's an endless story. And so it is part of the whole scene, finally, and you don't want to have it. You can pay five digit amounts of money for one lens to get rid of that master primes from size for example but there's maybe always a tiny little bit but the more you have fact is the less quality you have in your class and of course that's not fun and for textures that is not really something you want to have and it is less in my world at least in longer lenses than in wide angle lenses and another reason why i prefer to shoot with longer lenses to avoid this problem if you have such problems i would normally suggest to go to the sewers before you even start to work on an image and that is typically in lightroom and of course lightroom has options for that even uh, the raw converter Adobe's camera raw ACR has that. It's pretty much the same here. And when I have an image here for my lens, that is a 40 millimeter lens, then I can just go here and say, remove chromatic aberration, for example, and it takes this away. We have to set this up. And the problem is, of course, if you have something similar in color, it will take that all away. So these here have to be very precisely set. Another problem is, of course, the distortion and the vignetting that I have mentioned. And this has to do with something like that. You can see here the distortion and I go maybe in one direction and then I go into the other direction. And normally when you have a standard lens and here this 40 millimeter pancake lens is certainly a standard by now, has some data in the database. So you can see this here already. And it's certainly not this lens here, which <laughs> distorts completely different and you get different results here. So back to this lens and then you get hopefully the right. And sometimes you have more profiles when more people have put data into it. So the distortion is repairable, but keep in mind, it's not for free. Whatever you do to an image, when you move a pixel only a little bit around, it mixes up with the neighbors and then it gets blurry and vignetting is something that has nothing to do with getting blurry it's only a brightness adjustment which i would really suggest photograph with a very even lighting a gray card and then measure these values you can see these values here and when you have everything gray it's maybe one time only that you know this lens needs this value and then you can adjust this to your best knowledge. Of course, it makes really the world, especially when you tile an image and it has this dark vignetting, not very funny. There's something that we can't really do to an image directly here in Lightroom. And that is when the distortion or the blurriness starts to increase to the border because the lens construction is not very well. and. Normally I would think here a 40 millimeter lens for $150 is normally a candidate to have this kind of blurriness, but it's pretty stable. I was surprised. I thought I have here a good example where I can improve something, but not the case really. So when you need to do something like that, deconvolution is the process. And I'll show you that here. To make that pretty fast, I take here just a small little area. And then I go here to filters and one of the deconvolution filters is Topaz in focus, in focus, <laughs> sorry for that. And you have to reset everything because the lower part here is standard sharpening and that is not really advisable in the first place. So you go here maybe to this position and then you see here some ringing in. So you have done it too much. You can go a little bit lower and when you see only a little bit, you can suppress this, of course. And this algorithm tries to find what was finally originally sharp. And it doesn't take just the edges and increase the contrast here. The sharpness does those things and it does it really heavy. So you see here the contrast more and more. I can go here a little bit crazy with that. 
this is not really what I like. This is more the way it should be. And when I press the space bar here, you can see that was before. And we get a little bit of that. It's always a tricky thing. So when you have something like that, that the borders are too blurry and you need urgently that image you can't use by the lens, then you can take a mask, a layer mask, and then a radial gradient to move toward the borders a little bit sharper and in the middle you have that original picture. Not my ideal, of course. I would try always to get the best lens for the job, but sometimes we have to deal with those things. Okay, that sums it up already. And ready and we go to the second part of this list. So we have discussed chromatic aberration, the sharpness to the borders, the vignetting and the lens distortion. Okay, let's have a look. And when I go here to these four points, a relation to the surface, light temperature, HDRI, fast and stable. These four are just four little seams uh, to put these also into the discussion. And the first relation to the surface. First of all, we have here our camera and then we have here our object that we want to photograph. This could be from the side or from the top view. Either way, we want to have a look here from this object just straight through it. 90 degrees here in both direction, horizontal or vertical. And then we get the best relation because our sensor should be parallel to the object. That's the whole trick. There is of course an option to go with the shift lens, but this integrates then new problems with perspective and parallax and perspective and so on. <laughs> okay, this is important. And I have shown you some pictures when we look from the side or when we look from the front. It's a complete different image and you can't just go ahead and take this image and then just drag it into this size and cut it out because this area here is then a less in sharpness resolution and so on and this is a little bit more and then you have something that doesn't work at all. Anyway, that's the little hint to relation to the surface, always 90 degrees if possible. Then light temperature. If you shoot in RAW, this is not really a concern, but when you have here on your viewfinder on the camera a little histogram, something like this, the information that you get is not from the RAW, it is from a JPEG roughly set. And the JPEG is here only a um, placeholder for everything that is 8-bit and very fast produced. Because anything that you have set up, for example, a profile or the color temperature or whatever theme you had in your camera, landscape or whatever, lots of things can happen. And all of that goes into that image, even if you can't see it really, but it goes into that little histogram. It's not the raw data. And so a different color temperature, when you have set up a different color temperature, it will change the histogram. It's not the same. In RAW, it is just metadata. It's something that is remembered. And normally, the data that the sensor produces is stored in the RAW. And then later on, you take all the metadata in the RAW developer and do your thing. But if you make adjustments, based on some settings that you might not use later on and they are perhaps totally off, then this histogram will give you not the right idea what's all about in the picture. So if possible, don't use any auto settings. Use everything set to neutral. No sharpening, no automatic color temperature, no saturation on top of that or something like that. Just as neutral as possible. So the second part is then very fast, very quick. What I want to do here is to show where the camera is. And then I go here just with my 
few vector and this here should be the object that we want to photograph and if that is the top or side view is exactly the same here i want to have a 90 degree angle here it should be perpendicular because otherwise you have an image that looks like this and you have to stretch it to get it straight and then you have here less information here you have more and this gets blurry this stays roughly and uh, it's all not in the way this is the way to go relation to the surface perpendicular just like that light temperature um it's all in the raw and if you use raw don't care too much about where you have to care about is that little histogram that you have on your camera that is fed by a light temperature that you have set up it's not included in raw but what you see here in the histogram is let's say jpeg information it is based on the color temperature that you have set up on the profile that you have in your camera if that is landscape faceful or whatever and it has a lot of other settings here and everything should be on neutral in your camera no sharpening no saturation no nothing just neutral and all of that goes from the camera then through the cpu in your camera and creates then this little histogram you react on this histogram and you make decisions and then the raw is not as it was before so there is a feedback loop that might be not really healthy so get to know your camera as much as possible so you know finally that all these settings here are related to the re reality in the picture if you shoot a red wall the automatic color temperature is thrown off and so on okay hdi why i get always so enthusiastic with hdi and say if your camera can shoot bracketing then use at least a promote like i have to do with my nearly old camera already <laughs> anyway the idea is that every camera has a camera response curve and when you shoot something here on this position the application that finally develops your images can't really tell what happens to this poor little thing here but if you shoot some stops over have the same camera response curve but this time it's darker so it moves more up this time here it's maybe here and it moves more down or in the opposite direction it doesn't matter what it does but the application knows now how to treat exactly the same and it can create here a linear relationship and of course to make this story a little bit longer sometimes when people like to crash the plaques like this one here and then have to be of course more contrasty in the middle because they have lost the already a little bit space and then want to roll out the highlights then you get a lot of contrast here crashed plaques and rolled out highlights and then put this into a linear space format first you have to undo this you have to undo this and you have to undo this so exactly the opposite curve and that is sometimes a source for disaster if you just put this before you undo all of that into that you have something here in it that has a curve because the format itself can't not doesn't know what you're doing it just plays it in it's a container it's not an application that knows what you have done to the picture and straighten it out so just to use OpenEXR makes nothing linear it's a container for linear not just something that creates linearity okay fast and stable one little hint to the end a tripod a tripod is needed to get really stable data and it should be easy to set up very fast no screws and the camera by the way should be mountable with one click there should be no screw no nothing it should be fast very fast because anything else keeps you away from using it and what you don't use will not support your work and so you get maybe a little bit blurry even if you can hold like i do a second very still but if you do it with a long lens for three or four hours and then it is not possible anymore use a tripod as often as possible that sums it up thanks for listening have fun with it bye bye